Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and this is our next installment for the Octurian Analog, which I am finding super, super fascinating. I just going to warn you guys, I'm a little bit under the weather today. So if I sound a little bit low in energy, that is why nothing to be concerned about. Apparently, I'm just purging. So yay. Um, anyway, but today we're going to be talking about Sunat Kumar, who is the starship commander of the Octarian, or well, probably one of the Octarian ships. I'm sure they have many, many ships out there. If you missed any of the previous episodes from the Octarian Analog, I will place those down in the description box below. As always, I suggest getting your own copy of this book so that you can do your own research and come to your own conclusions. All right, Sunat Kumar, Starship Commander, Part 1. I speak with you through words, yet words are very primitive means of communication. But we will use what is available to us. Now, most of you guys are, I know, because I've got like the best community here on YouTube, most of you guys are a lot like me where you feel energy. And so I understand that. Like I, even as a child, I think that's a lot of us, I, I think that's what caused a lot of confusion and maybe some anxiety for a lot of us is because we could pick up on energy and the energy was not matching the words spoken by people around us, if that makes sense. And we, in this matrix system, have been taught to feel and think more with our analytical mind, our reasoning, versus our intuitive mind, which if we look at that with the energy systems within the body, the analytical mind, the mind of reason is the masculine energy, whereas the intuitive mind is the feminine energy that runs through all men and women and of course we know this is a war on the divine feminine and so reading that energy is something that we all have the ability to do and that's a lot of the telepathy as well and maybe again as children we were more attuned to that but we were taught through the matrix system to not take that seriously so i understand what he's saying here words are very primitive talk is cheap right action is everything energy is everything so let's let me read that again i speak with you through words yet words are very primitive means of communication but we will use what is available to us i am known as sunat kumar i shall be the first to speak for my fellow octarians be not because i am more elevated but because i am very 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 old same Boo, same. <laughs> I must really have um, quite a soft spot for planet Earth to be back here yet again. I feel that in my bones. Very, very, very old. <laughs> I have the perspective in, of intergalactic history and I carry within me the passion and the commitment as well as the benevolent intention shared by all Octarians. I reside in multiple dimensions of consciousness simultaneously. At this moment, in order to communicate through words, I am engaging my fifth dimensional aspect. However, my preference is to remain in the ninth dimension because it gives me an expanded perception. It is here that I retain my physical form and light, yet poised at the threshold of formless light. It is an interesting juxtaposition, this ninth dimension. The juxtaposition between form and formless creates an interesting dichotomy, a paradox, and we Octarians are fascinated by paradoxes and dichotomies. As a race of intergalactic beings, we reside primarily in the fifth through the ninth dimension. When we ascend past the ninth dimension, our identity as an Octarian shifts. We become more light forms. Most of us prefer to keep our self-identity intact. This is because we Octarians enjoy the exhilaration of individual autonomy in the midst of forces that continually work to degrade or eliminate self-identity. It is a peculiar art form, one which we enjoy very much. Enjoyment of our existence is one of the hallmarks of Octarian consciousness. Another hallmark of Octarian inclination is our need for a mission. We are not warlike, but we are fearless. When faced with forces seemingly larger than our own, we will find a way to work with or around such forces. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So I know for me, or I've been told, and this is what resonates, that I am predominantly Lyran, but I also have Palladian and Octurian in me as well. And that idea of being fearless, it's not that I'm fearless. Like I, I want to say, 
you know, I, I feel like for me as a person, I do have a lot of courage. I will do stuff if I feel like I need to. Uh, my mother has talked about that before. Like I will absolutely do things. I, I might be afraid while I'm doing it, but I will do them if I feel like they are necessary. I'll never forget the first day walking into the yoga shala in India. My first trip there, I was shaking, but I had to do it. Like I just knew I had to, I had to be there. Right. Um, I will be the first person that if you told me we were going to go bungee jumping or going to go, you know, jump out of an airplane, I would, I would go with you and I would be terrified the whole time, but I would feel like it's something I need to do. So I, I totally get that. I think a lot of us feel that, although I do have fear, I'm not fearless. Um, I think, I think I, what I'm getting for this is that us in human form that carry Octarian lineage might have a lot of courage. Um, also the Lyrans do have courage too, because they are, are the Lyrans are the lion. You know, but there, from what I understand, Lyrans are more sensual, which, yeah, I, I can be sensual too. So I, I feel like the Octarians are more like, let's go do this, where the Oct Lyrans are strong and that way as well, but more sensual. So I hope that makes sense. Let me know if that resonates with you. Our experience as an intergalactic civilization spans hundreds of millions of your years. And our experience of this universe is that it is filled to the brim with extraordinary energies and beings. Some of these energies have form, some of them do not. Some of them are benevolent, and some of them are malev of malevolent intent. Yeah. Not all intergalactic beings are loving. Make no mistake about it. My earthly brothers and sisters, I think we know this. We do know this. We have been cast into the role of guardian protectors through a combination of our nature and circumstances. We stand for the advancement of life, intelligence, and benevolence. We believe that beings should be free so long as they do not limit the freedoms of others. Well, let me read that in the back for those who didn't here because we can definitely point out these contradictions for the normies but we also see these contradictions in our own community as well okay so let me read that about your freedoms end when they start to um affect other people's freedoms if that makes sense right so if you're super christian your freedom of religion ends when you start to try to force your beliefs onto other people same thing with the leftist. So make no mistake about it. These are issues on both sides of this dichotomy of this timeline that we're in. So let me read that again. We stand for the advancement of life, intelligence, and benevolence. We believe that beings should be free so long as they do not limit the freedom of others. Our technology allows us to be guardian protectors of many worlds, especially of Earth, and this galaxy that is your home, which you refer to as the Milky Way. We find this reference amusing. Milky was so important to those who conceived the cosmos when they looked into the heavens. Since the Hathors introduced us, so to speak, in this manuscript, I would now like to turn my attention to a far distant memory. Billions of years ago in your time when the universe came into existence, when this universe was birthed in a fiery explosion, its very nature was dictated by opposing forces. We talk about this all the time. When we began our exploration as an intergalactic civilization approximately 100 million years ago, we became fascinated by the opposing forces and our technology is centered around the harnessing of latent energies between opposing forces it was approximately 90 million years ago that i became what you might call a starship commander how i rose to that position and how i became responsible for the milky way is of very little interest to me the mission is what is important as I settled into my new responsibility as a sector commander, there were several worlds or planets within your galaxy that fascinated me. Now it is here in the story of my life as an Acturian sector commander that personal choices intervenes into the course of history. We Acturians do not shy away from taking action when it is required. I just said that about myself. Like, 
Let me know if you're that way too. I think a lot of people that we call adrenaline junkies probably have Octarian lineage in their DNA. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming most of you watching are probably understanding this. It's like when you're terrified to do something, but you know you have to take action and you're still negotiating that action in your head, but you still go for it. Like, you know, it has to be done. And so you, you like put your big girl panties on and you just do it. Even though you're shaking and you're scared, you fucking do it. Of course, any action taken must be analyzed from as many perspectives as possible to determine the highest result. Yet even with the best intentions, all actions in this universe are a gamble due to the arising of opposing forces. But do recall that we are integrated by the opposing forces. So when we understand or undertake an action, we understand that it may take a long time to secure the result and opposition forces will arise. But this does not deter us. It only inspires us with greater passion. This is an Octarian trait not shared by many other intergalactic civilizations. Okay, there you go. So even like, I think probably like, not to brag or anything, but I am probably out of all the people in this community, I probably get the most death threats. And it's because I'm challenging the church, right? And it's and, and so I know, I do know that by exposing all of these texts, by talking about the history of the church, by talking about the real Yahshua, the real Magdalene, it's going to challenge the programming, the mind control, the MKUltra mind control that the church has done over the Christian people. Right. And so the opposition does come. They're good little soldiers for the controllers. I know this. They're they're just like, you know, Dylan, whatever his name is. You know, they're they're trained. They've been trained through mind control to oppose truth. Right. But it doesn't it doesn't stop me from continuing to go out there and do it. Um, you guys know I've been plagued with like death spells put on me. I have had poverty spells put on me. I have had spell casting done to my YouTube channel. All that kind of stuff doesn't stop me. In fact, I have been told off camera that the reason that I really pissed the coven off because I won't stop. No matter what they throw at me, I still get up every day and I still put the research forward. And I guess that's because of my Octarian lineage. Like that's what I have to do. It's hard. And sometimes I wish I could just go live in obscurity in Florida and just like live my life, live my best life on the beach every day. But I know that that's not, this is my dharma. This is what I have to do. This is what I came here to do, right? And so maybe in, in, the, in the greater cosmos, when I, as a soul, was creating my lineage for this lifetime to get the dharma done that needed to get done, maybe that's why I picked Octarian DNA. I don't know. Good question to ask. Think about that in your own life. I use my life only as an example. Think about that in your own life, in your own dharma, in your own purpose. Like when it, and to have times, have you done something and you were scared shitless to do it? You knew that there was going to be opposition. You knew it was going to take time for that seed to be planted and spread of, of what you were doing, but you did it anyway. You, you, you were scared the whole time, but you did it anyway. Think about that in your own life. And maybe that is your Octarian heritage coming through. And if that's true, if that's if you have that Octarian heritage, knowledge is power. Now you know, now you know that you, baby girl and baby boy, you can do hard things. You absolutely can do hard. If I can do hard things, you sure as hell can do hard things. Be proud of that. Be very proud of that. As the sector commander responsible for the Milky Way, which is ironic because your uh, universe is approximately 37 light years from Octarius, the decision was made, as I said, early on through a combination of our nature and circumstances to be protectors of life, intelligence, and freedom. And as we explained, our civilization to other star systems, we carried this benevolent intent as our primary derivative. And so I found myself being the one in charge of protecting life, intelligence, and freedom for the Milky Way. Not that other intergalactic civilizations were not doing their own thing for your galaxy is a hub of extraordinary activity and interactions between many different intergalactic civilizations. Nevertheless, I sensed a deep commitment to my duty, my responsibilities, and my mission 
which was to protect life, intelligence, and freedom in your galaxy to the greatest extent of which I was capable. This leads us to an invitation, an invitation I made to a parallel universe. Your universe is but one of many. And by entering hyperspace, it is possible to experience these other continuous universes. In a deep state of what you call meditation, I was contemplating the resources needed to counteroppose the imbalances inherited in this universe. By imbalances, I mean the warring between opposition, opposing forces. Was there a way to bring these forces into a more benevolent relationship? This was my inquiry as I entered the meditative states repeatedly. These meditations, you might call them, took place when I was not on duty, for as an Octurian, I must always deal with what is happening. In one of these meditative states, I traveled through Sirius into hyperspace. When I say I traveled through Sirius, I do not mean that I took the starship under my command through the Stargate or portal. I mean I sent an aspect of myself, a ball of pure awareness. This capacity to send an aspect in the form of a spear, that is a pure awareness, comes naturally to an Octurian. It is something that has to be refined and developed, but it is an inherited ability we possess. Hello, people who can astro travel, which I literally just learned like six months ago that I have been astro traveling my whole life and didn't know that's what that was. <laughs> and I'm, I'm 40 and I just realized like six months ago that literally I've been astro traveling since I was a kid and I didn't even connect that that's what I was doing. So now that I know what it is, and I know when it's coming, I can feel it coming. Like I can literally feel it in my body. I have to like rush home because I don't, I still don't quite know how to control it. So um, yeah, anyway, that's just interesting. So let me know down in the comment section if that's something that you've been doing too. If that's something that you just kind of do and you didn't know you were doing it or maybe you just realized and anyway. <laughs> This is why the normies think we're batshit crazy, by the way. <laughs> to make a very long story short, I explored several continuous universes to see if there might be a resource that could help us bring balance to the Milky Way. That term never fails to amuse me. It is during one of these cosmic incursions that I encountered the Hathors and recognized their unique qualities and abilities. You might call the feminine and the masculine aspects of their being are more in perfect balance. So we know we talked about that with the Hathor material. We know that the darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can create. And so what the darkness does is it mimics the light or it will steal from the light and invert. And with this idea of the balance between men, uh, feminine and masculine energy within one singular being that was created that way by God, we can see how the darkness now in our earth is trying to invert that, right? It's pretty obvious, right? I prefer to view this as the balancing of electricity and magnetism. One of the things I found most interesting about these Hathors was that they had gone through an ascension process collectively. We Acturians also go through an ascension process, but it is not done collectively. Individuals make the ascent according to their own volition. During one of my cosmic incursions into their universe, I invited a few of their more developed individuals to join me at my station. This was an amusing experience for me and my crew. Hathors are light beings, as are we, but they do not descend into matter. And when I invited these particular individuals to join me on the ship that was in the fifth dimension, although it could descend into third dimension time and space if needed. The Hathors that came to join me were in the eighth and ninth dimension. So for them, the fifth dimension was slumming it. We're in third dimension, by the way. So if fifth dimension is slumming it. We really are like the ghetto of the universe. Hathors and their anthropomorphic form, and by that, by that I mean human-like, are generally taller than we are. They tend to be 12 to 14 feet tall. The passageway in our ships was about 10 to 11 feet tall, depending on where in the ship you were. So if they brought their vibration down into the fifth dimension, they had to hunch over. As a result, they prefer to remain in the eighth and ninth dimension. 
I think we can understand that. I am average height for a woman. I'm really tall in India. Let's just say that I'm really, really tall in India. I'm also really tall in Spain. When I spent a summer in Spain, I was like the tallest chick there. But I'm average height. I'm like 5'5", five, five, average height for a woman. But, so I don't have to hunch that much. But think about having to like, I mean, for those of you that are really tall, you can probably have some empathy for them. Like to be 14 feet tall and only be in a room that's like got like 10 foot ceilings, to have to hunch the whole time, I'm sure is is just not fun. It's probably pretty painful. So I don't blame the Hathors for being like, you know what? We're going to stay in our dimension there, buddy, because coming down to your dimension, it's just a lot, a lot of aches and pains. I gave them a tour of the sector, meaning the entire width and breadth of our galaxy. And as we observed together, the cosmic furnace that birthed and destroyed planets, stars, and all the myriad other objects that composed our galaxy. As, as had I, they became fascinated by a small primitive planet in one of the outer spirals. It looked bluish because there was so much water. The Hathors are fascinated by color. The planet was your Earth in its very early stages of development. I would often find them, the Hathors, on the bridge of the starship, fascinated by the sun of your solar systems, its planets, and especially your Earth. I asked them, after what was about 100 years of your Earth time, if they would be interested in a proposition. During this 100-year period, these particular Hathors were on the starship. I explained that I thought the presence of their balanced energies would be a benevolent influence in the sector that I was responsible for. Always the mission, always the mission. They said they would return to their home and discuss it with their elders. Now we accelerate in time to approximately 10 million years ago. Earth had passed through some very tumultuous geological birthing pangs, and there was a degree of stability, geologically speaking, in some areas of the planet. I decided to touch down upon the fledgling planet that I had to observe for some time. I sent my starship, what you might call a shuttle, with a smaller version of the mothership. I sent this vessel in the area you call Japan, on a mountaintop called Kumara. If you go to this spot, you will find a shrine marking the point of descent and ascent. I was going to absolutely do a deep dive into, into Sunat Kumar before reading this section of the book, but opted not to. So I kind of knew a little bit about the whole Japan thing. Um, I opted not to because I wanted to hear it from him, his words. I wanted you to hear it from his words and not my own. So I kind of smile because, yeah, this if you research Sunat Kumar, this is, this is true. If you live in Japan or if you've been to Kumara Mountain and you've seen this, let us know. I had interaction with those people in their very early formative periods. As it is often the case with intergalactic travelers to new worlds, I fell in love of one of the more extraordinary women. You would call her a shaman. She was able to travel through the interdimensional worlds. It's always about a woman, isn't it? I just, I just I'm giggling because like, I mean, I love that. I, I, I love that. Like I'm a sucker for romance. I absolutely think that's beautiful. I, um, one of my friends from high school, I'll, I'll refrain from using his name because he's not a public person, but, um, after college, I, I lived in California and Los Angeles for a really long time. And he ended up moving out there too. So we became really cl close friends again. We'd grown up together and he was constantly at my place and all that kind of stuff. He was an only child growing up. Um, and he told us a story when he was probably our, he was a few years older than me in school. So he was probably like 14. I was probably like 12 at the time. But it was after supper one night, he was saying that his mom said to his dad and to him like you got to do the dishes and she like left the kitchen and he and his dad were cleaning up from dinner and my friend was like dad this i'm really trying not to use his name dad this really sucks like why do we have to do the dishes why do we have to do this why can't mom do this and his dad said son in a marriage the woman owns 50 percent of the assets 
and 100% of bedroom activity. He used the P word, which I'm not going to use on this channel, but bedroom activity. And so I'm laughing. I'm thinking of that story. Like I'm sure as a 14 year old, he was mortified to hear his dad say that about his mom because you don't want to think about your parents ever doing that. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but the stork brought me. Um, in fact, when my sister, when my sister got pregnant with my nephew, my sister is younger than me, but when she got pregnant with my nephew, I was elated. First of all, I was so excited about being an aunt because I just love being, I love my nephew and nieces so much, but I was so excited about being an aunt. But I was also really excited because mom and dad knew for sure that she wasn't a virgin anymore. <laughs> it's still questionable with me because I don't have any kids. So it's still questionable. Even though I've lived with quite a few men, it's still very questionable because I have no evidence. But there's evidence with my sister. She's got evidence. <laughs> She's not a virgin. So I, I anyway, I laugh. So let, let's continue. Romance is amazing. Keep, keep doing romance. It's amazing. And men, treat your women like queens. Let them know that you adore them and you think they're beautiful. Like, just do that. It, it, will, it will make your marriage and your relationship so much better if you are act like you're in love with your partner. I was of the fifth dimension and she was of the third, but due to her remarkable abilities as a shaman, a cosmic traveler, she clearly sensed my presence in the presence of the crew. I wonder if there are any like off-worlders that have a crush on me like that. <laughs> like you're hanging around. You too, like ask, like, do you do you guys think that there are any off-worlders hanging around you that are like in love with you? <laughs> just that just kind of like put a totally different perspective on the things like when you feel a presence around you like anyway i i'm i'm joking but seriously even though i'm joking seriously like let me know if you felt like maybe there was an off world or kind of looking at you in a very romantic way anyway all right due to her extraordinary capability she shifted her identity into the fifth dimensional life body and she showed me the area and we conceived a child in the fifth dimension Due to her exceptional abilities, however, she brought the vibratory rate of my speed into the third dimension and gave birth to a daughter. It's always a daughter. It's always a daughter. When the time came for me to leave due to duties that compromised the entire galaxy, I had to depart before she gave birth. That is not an excuse. Listen, Sunat Kumar. Listen, all you baby daddies, I don't care if you got to go save the universe. If your wife, if your woman is pushing a human out of her hoo-ha and you put that human in her hoo-ha, you best be there. You best be there. Don't just dip out and be like, honey, I got to go save the universe. No, you best be there. That is not an excuse. He goes on to say, but I was able to be in full contact with her whenever I entered cosmic contemplation. Still not an excuse. That'd be like us humans being like, listen, babe, I know you're about to give birth to my child, but I really want to go to this basketball game. I'll text you. Just te we'll just keep we'll just text each other. Perhaps it was because Earth is such an extraordinary planet with such tremendous potential that I became so fascinated and engaged with this orb. From the perspective, it seemed as if this far-flung planet of an outer spiral was so important to the mission. Perhaps it was simply because I had fallen in love with a woman of that world and her daughter, our daughter. Being the commander of a starship, much less the commander of a sector, requires personal sacrifices far beyond the norms of most individuals. Her name was Ashura, and my love for her has spanned 10 million years. She and I can still be in communication with each other in other dimensions, even though we are physically separated. Sounds a lot like twin flames. A lot of times twin flames are physically separated for long periods of time. But usually with twin flames, it's because of karmic people coming in and pulling them apart. So, as I said, Octarians are mission-oriented, and when I accepted the post as commander of a sector, that mission became the overpowering light and motivation for my actions. I was surprised by the love affair. It was unanticipated. She touched me deeply as a being, and it was difficult at a personal level, level to leave Mount Kumara, her presence in our daughter. But the mission was deemed larger and more important by me in that moment. 
Ooh, that stings. That really stings. That would hurt to hear as the companion and mother of someone's child to hear that. Sorry, I love you guys, but this is more important to me. It stinks. I sense my fellow Octarians listening to this conversation, some with bated breath, as you say. If I had to do it all over again, would I have done it the same way? I cannot say for sure. My duty as a sector commander were and are the overarching motivations for my actions, but it is deep sadness personally that the mission eclipsed the feelings of my own heart. I think this is tension between our Octarian natures to align with mission needs, to be tempted by the calling and the needs of the, our personal heart. There, I have said it. It's in the record. Yeah, and I guess that again is the Lyran in me as well, because Lyrans are very sensual. So that's why I think your responsibility is to the person that you've decided to love and to be with. And of course your children, you know, I've said this before. I'm, if I, you know, I'm 40. So if I, it, there's a possibility I could be with someone, end up with someone with children. And I have thought about that a lot because I have step parents. I have an incredible stepfather, not a great stepmother. And I have learned a lot from that um, of how I would never want to be. If I ever was a stepmother, I would never interfere with the relationship between my husband and his children. The way I see it is that if you marry someone with children, those children are a part of the person that you married. They're a part of them. And so your duty is also to them. So yeah, children are a, a, a very important part of, of their parents. And so, yeah, I just, I think it's sad when other people come in and to marriages or relationships and try to derail the relationship the child has with their parent. Um, if I married a man with, with children or if I was with a man with children, I would insist that he take time with just the children and not me. I would really make that relationship a priority because I know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that. I haven't, I haven't gotten a birthday text from my dad or a Christmas text from my dad since I was like 18, 19 years old, mostly because of my stepmother, you know, like it's, it's just, that's not okay. That's not acceptable. So I'm, I'm very, that's, that's very important to me that, that especially with fathers and daughters, especially. All right. I'm still the sector commander for the Milky Way and will continue to be so for some large expanse of time. But when my task has been completed, I will undertake no more. And I shall join with my Ashura and we shall live the life that we might have lived if I, if I had remained on Mount Kumara. We will continue as light beings, but only up to the ninth dimension, so I may still feel her touch. I long still for her touch. That's bro i think we understand you like i get that totally get that i'm sure she longs for your touch too let us turn our attention back to the mention and our unexpected adventures with the hathors the hathors returned from their home in the parallel universe the portal of cyrus and came straight away to me and my my starship they announced they would accept my offer and would send a team with differing abilities and one of their interdimensional vessels we agreed upon a rendezvous point near Cyrus. Serious. Sorry. Four starships of our fleet went to meet them. We went to protect them. They were, after all, invited guests to this strange universe that is far different from the one they came from. When their ship emerged through the Stargate of Sirius, I was the most I was most fascinated by, by what I saw. Let me try that again. <laughs> when their star when their ship emerged through the Stargate of Sirius, I was most fascinated by what I saw. While I am told that they have different configurations of vessels, this vessel was shaped remarkably similar to a Natalis shell, Natalius, N-A-U-T-I-L-U-S shell. And as far as I could tell, there were no, ar there were no armaments. A notion I found preposterous, but not surprising. What I mean by this is that the Hathor's defenses lies in their ability to move up and down the energy spectrum. They will not engage in battle. They will simply disappear from the space where the encounter might occur. 
they bolt basically <laughs> they're like not my circus not my monkeys yo i'm out <laughs> This is a very differently strange than we Octarians. Our starships are equipped with complex arrays of technology and armament. We are the most well-fortified star starships in the universe as far as we have encountered. And I would emphasize as far as we have encountered. What I find of particular interest is the dual nature of this alliance between we Octarians and the Hathors. The Hathors are non-interventionalist. And we will not hesitate to intervene when necessary. The Hathors avoid confrontation. We will not step aside from it if it is required. The Hathors are in a vibratory state of love and ecstasy, and that is their gift to those fortunate enough to be in their presence. For some time, this single Hathorian vessel was in the sector of the Milky Way, and they were inexpressibly drawn to the blurb orb of your planet. Their first stop, however, was to Venus, and there was something about the raw energetics and gaseous nature of the atmosphere that they found resourceful, shall we say. I want to go to Venus. I think I was supposed to go to Venus, and my GPS got lost when I was coming to Venus, and I ended up here on Earth. That is my theory. But their main interest was Earth. For what spanned perhaps two million years, the single Hathorian vessel collected data and information and then gave word that it was safe to send the main group. Four of our starships returned to the post near the Stargate of Sirius, and 13 Hathorian Natulis-like ships entered this universe. We escorted them to Venus, and then in a conference between us and them, they laid out their plans of the benevolent influence. While contact was made with a group of Atlanteans, the main contact occurred with Lumerians. This is because the Atlanteans were highly mental. The Lumerians had more developed hearts, mainly their capacity to feel. But from what I understand, the Lumerians were here before the Atlanteans were. The Lumerians existed before the time of confusion, meaning before Atlantis. So it was more natural fit for the Hathors. When Atlantis and Lumeria fell, the initiates of these various traditions were scattered across the world. Lumeria fell first, and then Atlantis fell. Lumeria, it went, it went, so from what I understand, the timeline goes, Lumeria, Atlantis, the apocalypse, Tartaria, the a thousand years of peace, mud floods, Gog and Magog. We're in Gog and Magog. How gangster is that? <laughs> Initiates who were trained in the ability to enter dream time to follow their lead into what is now Egypt. They actually led them into northern Africa. No, sorry, Tom Kenyon. But the focal point of their influence was centered into what is now Egypt. No, see, I've talked about this before. So channelers are channeling through their perceived concept of knowledge. Okay. And so Tom Kenyon is channeling through his perceived concept of where Egypt is. We know now that the Egypt in Africa, it's not Egypt. The southeast of the United States, down into Florida, all the way up to Washington, D.C., is Egypt. Like, we, we pretty much know that now. If, if you, this is shocking information to you, there are tons of channels, not, not even channels in our community, but other people who are literally dedicated to showing proof that this area is actually Egypt. I mean, we see it alone with the state native Tennessee. What does Tennessee mean? Well, a sea was Isis. So the land of Isis, aka Egypt. That's why there's so many Isis temples here in the United States. So that is probably Tom Kenyon's goof up in his channeling. They were probably talking about going to Egypt, leading people into Egypt, which was the, the Egypt's where the leftover Atlanteans. But in Tom Kenyon's mind, as he was channeling this, he was seeing Egypt and Africa, not the real Egypt, which is here in the southeastern United States. So just understand that when you're reading channelings, you are reading a channeling through the perception of the channeler. So things are going to get lost in translation. Okay. It was here in the early, early formative period of Egypt culture that they planted their roots, so to speak, and worked through the Hathor goddess temple. They speak in this in their book, The Hathor Material, which we've already gone through. And so there is no need for me to go into this further. But what I find interesting and paradoxical is this alliance between us and them. And you will recall my comment early on that we Octurians are intrigued by paradoxes and dichotomies. Whenever the Hathors feel a need to release an energetic of love, which is an impersonal love, by the way, or an energetic that is harmonious, 
which they have determined is needed in the unfoldment of their mission, they call upon us. They call upon us in our starship to protect them while they hover in a specific frequency domain. In other words, if their task to introduce benevolent balancing energies requires that they remain in the fifth dimension for a certain period of time, they would be vulnerable to those who do not wish for this type of empowerment to occur. Thus, they might be attacked while they are waiting for the completion of, the, of this energetic. Since time is crucial in these undertakings, we guard them while they complete their task. Otherwise, should they be attacked in the midst of releasing this balancing energe energetic, they would have to move out of that dimension into an other since they do not possess armaments. We do, however. And so our alliance has cast us into the fascinating arrangement. So they, they're basically their bodyguards. They are here to introduce seats of harmony and balance so that the ultimate outcome is a space where no one is attacked and no one attacks another. But in order to accomplish this, they must be protected by warriors. And so in this alliance, we are their protectors. Again, they're bodyguards. And since I have invited them into this universe, it is both my professional and personal responsibility. Their consciousness joins together and they create a bolus of energy which they release. They do not use the technology the way we would use technology. Their technology is the direct application of intention upon the light realms. They then direct that energetic to whatever dimension they happen to be working in. All of this leads us inexorably to the present time in your history. There are forces and counter forces. Some of these forces and intelligences are not interested in your well-being. That's putting it mildly. They do not share our commitment to the enhancement of life, intelligence, and freedom. They do, in point of fact, work for the opposite. And you who live upon the earth at this time are the witness to some extent of the co-creators of a world in transition. I imagine there are those reading this who may wonder what our suggestion is. How do human beings reach your higher potential in this moment of time? You are in the midst of a battle between those who would free you and those who would imprison you. There are those who hope for intervention. And while intervention is taking place, I need you to understand something about Octarian technology. Moving a starship from one dimension to another takes tremendous energy. Shifting the atomic structure of our vessel from the fifth dimension into the third would be a very demanding energetic act. We are quite capable of it, but it would only do, do so in the direct circumstances. In other words, shifting from fifth dimensional space into third dimensional space would allow you to see us and interact with us in your physical bodies. But the demands in our energy system within the vessel would be extreme. They talked about this in the beginning, which is why you're a fucking badass, because you're able to hold a human body. There are far more elegant and masterful ways to intervene. One way we intervene is through what you might call dream time, a sus suspended state of mental activity. Some might call it meditation. This type of meditation, however, is not a, a, an escape from reality or a hovering in serenity, but a tuning of the mind and the heart, the bandwidth of communication between us and you. I am hoping to do a big breakdown of meditation because so many people out there think they're meditating and they're not. They're daydreaming. That's why you need a meditation teacher. I don't think people actually understand what meditation is. They just kind of think they're doing it. They watch a YouTube video and that's that. You need a teacher. Meditation is not about daydreaming. It's about a one-pointed fo focus of the mind. As I said in the beginning of this, words are primitive means of communication, but being a practical species... We will use what we must. So I will attempt to say in words what is the essence of our message to you. You have been lied to. You have been manipulated. You have been conditioned to believe that you are much smaller than you really are. Your eyes have been veiled. You do not see the richness of the universe you live in. You have been cut off and continue to be cut off from the heart-to-heart -heart and mind-to-mind -mind communications of your intergalactic brothers and sisters. And by intergalactic brothers and sisters, we don't mean just Octarians or Hathors, for there are many, many intergalactic civilizations interacting with humanity. Now, I've talked about this before. I'm going to bring this up again because I think some people mis—I think some people misunderstood what I said. 
So this is why I believe that the controllers put the rhesus factor into our blood types. Now, I, again, an RH negative. And I've talked about this with RH negatives. RH negatives notoriously have what they call a stigmatism. It's not a stigmatism. It's the back of our eyes. The back. If you look at an RH positive person's eyes, it's like a circle. Ours are shaped like a diamond in the back of the eye, not in the pupil, not what you see, but in the back, the receiving area. So that means people who are RH negative, who have the diamond shape in the back of their eyes, see light differently. We literally see beyond the veil. This is why RH negative people tend to have more paranormal phenomenon happen to them because they can literally see things that rh positive people cannot see this again is why i believe the controllers put the rhesus factor into our blood groups and why all the controllers themselves remain rh negative just like me now when i said that rh positive or rh negative people tend to have astigmatism i had a lot of people saying i'm rh so RH negative people tend to have astigmatism that's because the back of their eyes are shaped like a diamond i had a lot of people in the comment section section saying I'm RH positive and have astigmatism. Yes, you are RH positive and you have astigmatism. RH negative people, however, have been diagnosed with astigmatism, but it's not what that is, right? The it, it comes back to the back of your eye. So if you're RH positive and you have astigmatism, you have astigmatism. You're at the back of your eye is in a circle. If you're RH negative and you have astigmatism, the back of your eye is shaped in a diamond. And it literally gives you abilities to see things that others literally cannot see because your eye is shaped differently. Your eye is equipped to see differently. All right. So I want to make that clear. All right. So if you really want to understand what I'm talking about, examine your eye. So with people who are arch negative that they diagnose with astigmatism, they do the same thing to arch negatives that they do to arch positives. They put us in glasses, they put us in contacts, and for the RH negative, it causes damaging effects to the abilities that they have to see with their eye. For an RH positive person who actually has astigmatism, it can help. The glasses can help, but not for negative. So that's what that means, all right? Just want to make that clear because that's what he's talking about is these different inherent abilities, okay? You have been cut off and continue to be cut off from the heart to mind, mind to heart communication from your intergalactic brothers and sisters. And by intergalactic brothers and sisters, we don't just mean Octarians or Hathors, for there are many, many intergalactic civilizations interacting with humanity. As a human being, you are intergalactic royalty. You have been seated by many different intergalactic cultures. You have been given extraordinary gifts and abilities, although they are currently lated. They reside in unused portions of your DNA. There you go, my friends. The 10 missing, again, the tribes of Israel are not Jacob's sons and their descendants. If you believe that the 12 tribes of Israel are Jacob from the Bible and his 12 sons and their kids, then you, my friend, are following the cabal. Jacob is the descendant. Father Abraham is the descendant of the Rothschilds. Hence why King James made up the Bible that we have. The real Bible is under the Vatican. But darkness can't create anything. Only the light can. The real tribes of Israel, the real 12 tribes are galactic. And those 10 missing tribes That's you, boo. Guess what? That's you. You have 10 strands of DNA that science calls junk DNA. You have two strands of DNA that are actually working, all well, kind of like halfway working. So what's 10 plus 2? 12. You are the 12 tribes of Israel within your DNA. Because you carry all these intergalactic traits. I already told you, I'm Lyran, Octurian, Palladian, who knows what else. And those 10 DNA strands, when they become activated, it's going to be a whole new world. I should say new earth, not new world, new earth. But the controllers don't want you to know that. Hence why the controllers took an internal 
magic, the 12 tribes of Israel, made it external through a guy named Jacob, that's their descendant, had you worship them. Once you see it, you cannot see it. Once you see it, you will never want to step foot in a church again. I cannot, like for the life of me, out. all these churches can go to hell for all I care. Which funnily enough, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to go to hell. So <laughs> it's funny because it's true. As an, as an Acturian, I find it preposterous that human beings believe themselves to be so little and think of themselves in such disdain. And your religions are to be held accountable. <laughs> I literally just said that. The lie perpetrated by many of your religions are an anthem of the elevation of life to intelligence and to freedom. So what I would say one of the premier tasks facing you, if you were to claim your potential as a true human being, is to cleanse yourself, cleanse your heart, your mind, and your cellar, cellular memory from the lies of your religion. Oh my God, I didn't even know that was coming. Let me reread that again. So I would say, so I would say one of the premier tasks facing you, if you are to claim your potential as a true human being, is to cleanse yourself, cleanse your heart, your mind, and your cellular memory from the lies of your religion. I now wish to turn my attention to the topic of Octurian technology. There are many levels and aspects of our technological advancement. One of these advancements is centered around lifespan. I imagine for earthbound beings, the idea that I or any other being could be millions of years old borders on the implausible, if not the impossible. As I said earlier, the Arcturians reside in the fifth through the ninth dimension. The bulk of our civilization is in the fifth dimension and our technologies use the unique properties of light. And as I said earlier, we use the mastery of opposing forces, and by this, I mean the subatomic forces and quantum dynamics. In our fifth dimensional bodies, our natural lifespan is several thousands of years of your time. But before we can become intergalactic civilization, we master the art of regenesis, which is the regeneration of the physical body, in our case, fifth dimensional body. The regenesis technology allows us to explore the universe without having to cryogenically suspend ourselves. The regenesis chamber is a tube rounded on both ends, and we enter it in various cycles of our life. The more demanding the situation and the draining of our life force, the more often we enter the regenesis chamber. The regenesis technology has allowed me to live for millions and millions of years. It has allowed me to explore dimensions of consciousness and develop abilities that I would have never developed had I been limited to the natural lifespan of a few thousand years. In the course of my exploration, I explored the higher dimensional bodies and decided upon the ninth dimension as my preferred energetic state. It is here that I retain the form and precious identity as an Octurian and have at the same time a more direct access to higher light realms. This resting or existing within the ninth dimensional reality gives me a luminous presence, which is why some people refer to me as an ascended master. It is here that we have the most interesting perceptual paradox. I do not wear white robes. I'm a sector commander and I usually wear my uniform. But my energy field scintillates with white light, which is simply a function of physics. Being in a lower energy state, even fifth dimension Octurian, will sense a luminous glow about me. A being in the third dimension can be overwhelmed by my presence because I can move through my own dimensionality from the fifth to the ninth. Some beings who have encountered me misinterpret their experience. It is true that I have a charismatic nature. It is true that my light body is a dazzling display, especially to those in lower dimensional realities. And it is true that I can shift through dimensions quite easily. But this ability has been acquired through a combination of Octurian technology and personal exploration. Without regenerous technology, I would not have had the leisure to develop these abilities. Furthermore, anyone who encounters me will experience me relatively to his or her own development or lack thereof. To a being who does not understand the use of quantum mechanics and light form technologies, I will seem like a god. I can seem to appear in the dimension where a being resides and then disappear, but this is due to a shifting of my frequency. 
The shifting of my frequency takes place through an interface between an Octurian device and my own intention. Without the device, I would not be able to move through the various dimensions. This device is with me at all times. It is a smaller version of a larger mechanism with the starship. The mechanism allows the starship to shift its molecular structure into a higher frequency or a lower frequency as required and as directed. This personal device is a similar technology. There is, I am afraid of misunderstanding about Ascended Masters in general and me in particular. Because a lower vibratory rate being, let's say a human, let's be, be precise here, encounters me through the tunnel of limited perception and intellectual understanding. He or she will have a delusional experience regarding my capabilities unless he or she is particularly intelligent and or experienced in such matters. Because I have a char charismatic energy and because the light that composes my higher dimensional body is so intense and because I have abilities that seem supernatural, a human being may fall prey to one of the greatest and most insidious traps for human consciousness, the worshipping of another being. Been saying this, my friends, been saying this. It is true that I am benevolent, but that is my nature as an Octurian. It is true that I am a protector, for that is both my nature and my mission. It is true that I am a guardian for the elevation of life, intelligence, and freedom, but this does not make me omniscient or omnipotent. I have my limitations and I have my faults. Part of my limitations and the limitations of my Octurians, as well as the limitations of any intergalactic being, is circumscribed by the advancement of his or her technology and by his or her understanding of the potential that exists. This is where the character of being and technology interact to create bene benevolent outcomes or benevolent intention, right? We see that with the AI. As Hill has said, now if you guys missed that episode, I'll put that down in the description box below. AI can be used for both the good and the bad. There are beings that you would call alien intelligence who have very advanced technology, but whose characters are highly suspect. Some of these beings are incredibly arrogant and, po and possess at the same time powerful technology, a very poor combination from our perspective. Some of these vengeful gods from your religions fall into this category. Some of your religions speak of benevolent gods, and these are more to our liking. But I would say to you, there are no more gods than I am. It is simply that they were perceived through a limited understanding of a more primitive people. It is difficult, if not impossible, to understand the true nature of higher nature reality by residing in a lower dimension. All you can experience in a lower dimension in relation to a higher dimensional beings are the after effects of the energetic encounter and the peculiar dimensional specific limitations of perception. It is here that I will mention one of the benevolent beings. You may know him as Jesus of Nazareth. Whoa, I know him as an actor. I know Tom Kenyon. Again, this is a channeler's perception. His name was not Jesus. It was Yeshua. And he was not from Nazareth. He was from Egypt. You, Tom Kenyon, still have some brainwashing from that. Remember, Sunat Kumar just said previously that you need to cleanse yourself of religious programming. That's religious programming. you got to cleanse yourself up. Of the Acturians, I know he is truly the most compassionate and benevolent I have ever met, and he has taken Acturian technology into application like no other Acturian has accomplished, but I will leave that to him when he chooses to speak. It, yeah, and that's the Yeshua. That's Yeshua. But remember, Magdalene, Magdalene was the Christ. She was, well, we're all the Christ, but she was the one that figured it out first. It is here at this junction that I sense the possibility of a crisis of faith among some who will be reading these words. You are experiencing cognitive dissonance around this revelation. I would say to you that the stature of this Octarian is not diminished by his use of Octarian technology. Rather, he is elevated through his characters and, and intentions. And I would say to you, my earthly brothers and sisters, the same applies to you. It is an interface between your character and intentions with your primitive technology that creates outcomes. And Yeshua and Magdalene were like me in the sense that they were both Lyran and Octarian. Remember, Lyrans carried the Christ consciousness, the lion. So they were both. A lot of you guys are, are those as well. Let's go back to your history and explain here. Before the invention of the wheel, when your world was in a very different place. Let me go back in your history to explain here. Before the invention of the wheel, when your world was a very different place, it was more difficult to move things. But among those early humans, there were differences in characters and intentions, just as there are now and will always be. 
Some were benevolently predisposed and cared not just for themselves, but also cared for others within their tribal group. Some were simply narcissists and cared only for themselves. The technology of the wheel allowed both to affect the world. As you moved forward in time, things started to speed up as you hit what you called the Industrial Revolution. It is faster still as you enter what is now called the Information Age, but the principles still apply. There are some who, who will use your technology for benevolent purposes. They will care for themselves and for others, while there are others at this point who care only for themselves and use your ever-advancing technology for their own ends without regard for the consequence of other humans, other life forms, or even the planet itself. Now let me address a paradox. Earlier I said your primitive technology, and then most recently in our discussion I said ever-advancing technology to you. Your technology is an accelerating behemoth of immense fascination. To us, your most advanced technologies are still primitive by our standards. Nonetheless, you are quickly advancing to a collective stage poised for planetary exploration and eventually galactic exploration as well. We know that the bad guys are already in galactic exploration. We know they've been doing that. It's already here. But in your spiral of human civilization, the fundamental principle applies. Will you be benevolent force a male or a malevolent force in the universe? Let us talk about communication. As I had said previously, we Acturians prefer to communicate with human beings through what you would call a meditative state of mind. I also indicated that it was through what I call cosmic contemplation that I traveled through Sirius to explore continuous universes. Certain meditative states of mind can be used as a need to communicate with other Octarians. In the center of your head is an organ of perception called the pineal gland. By organ of perception, I do not mean perception via the five senses. I mean perception of information from other dimensions of consciousness. When you enter a calm state of mental quintessence and focus your attention on the region of the pineal gland, you can activate its latent potentials as a receiver for cosmic information yes but as the half has also said that's your sixth chakra anja pineal gland the third eye your sixth eye is not your sixth eye your third eye is never your sixth chakra is never going to be good until you correct the lower three chakras no one ever wants to do that so they end up all delusional go down to muladhara you want a good third eye focus on muladhara the root chakra because it's just a domino effect. It is very much like the turner of your radio or television. It locks into a specific frequency domain, and by doing so, it, it gains access to all information that is being broadcast in that specific range of frequency. Your universe is a cornucopia of broadcast information. You exist in a sea of vibratory ex exonation and the transfer of both knowledge and information from one area of the cosmos to another. The transmission of information received via the pineal gland is not bound by the speed of light. This particular form of information is instantuous. It is one of your latent abilities as a human being to gain access, listen, listen in, as it were, to the cosmic conversations. Opening this field of knowledge brings with it a degree of responsibility, and so I must explain the dangers before I tell you how to do this, although some of you already know how. When you are in an agitated state of mind or emotional, it is not good to time to tune in, so to speak, to the cosmic conversation of the universe. This is because your emotional vibratory rate affects the quality of information and its accuracy. Just because you receive a communication, a flow of information or knowledge, it does not necessarily mean that it is accurate. As I said earlier, there are alien intelligence that are benevolent and some that are malevolent. I would further add to that some alien intelligence have exceptional intellects. Some are quite stupid to be blunt about it. If you wish to experiment with the mind bridge between you and we Acturians, there are a few things you need to master. Having said that, some of you are wired, so to speak, in such a way that you do not need to enter a serene, quincient state of mind to make contact. You can receive gnosis or direct knowledge. But most individuals need to enter a quincient state in order to use the mind to order to use the mind bridge. There are many, many methods to enter this quintessential state of mind and emotion. Your ancient tradition of yoga meditations offer many different approaches. 
I will offer one as a means to begin the great experiment of intergalactic and interspecies communication. I might also mention here that the same method can be used to communicate with animals. The easiest way for most in individuals is to use the breath. Simply focus on your inhales and exhales. Yes, it is important not to change the rhythm of your breath because your breath is connected to your nervous system and we want to calm the nervous system down. While you breathe in this way, focus on the gaps between your inhale and your exhale. As you continue to do this, eventually you will find your breath gets shallower. This is the calming of the mind-body complex. You must let it happen on its own. You cannot make it happen. You must be patient. As you continue to focus on the gaps between the inhales and the exhales, you will find the gaps getting longer. Your breath may pause. You may even stop breathing. Do not be concerned. You will breathe again when you need to. When the breath becomes very shallow, shallow and or stops altogether, you have entered a moment of quintessence. And when you shift your attention to the pineal gland in the center of your head and hold your awareness to the two central areas of attention, the gap between your inhales and your exhales in the pineal gland, and you do this, you will settle into a deeper state of quintessence. So the first mini experiment involves entering the quiet state of body and the mind many times. And when you feel that you are familiar with the method, you add the third and final piece, which is as you focus on the pineal, you hold the intention that the mind bridge opens between you and the Acturians or whomever you wish to communicate with. You will begin to receive the inflow of impressions. Don't think about these impressions. Just allow yourself to receive them. As you continue to master the method, you will be able to lock in the turner, so to speak, into frequency domains that you wish to communicate with. As you gain experience with this, you will recognize the vibratory quality or feeling that you are in the correct zone. Let me be clear on your responsibility as a receiver. First of all, realize that until you have mastered the locking in of specific frequencies through your intention, you can receive all manner of impression. Some of them pure, some of them mixed, some of them accurate, and some of them not. If you ever encounter a being who tells you what you must do, have nothing further to do with this entity. Your sovereign will is one of your greatest powers, and to give it away is a disservice to yourself and to your species. This applies also to what you deem to be spiritual beings, which I have indicated earlier often simply perceived by you in a manner of due to dimensional differences. If you choose to enter into a grand experiment of intergalactic and interspecies communication, the responsibility for the outcome is on you. I will not repeat myself because I do not like redundancy, but it bears repeating nonetheless. The burden of responsibility lies upon you. It's all about you, boo. My intention in sharing this information is benevolent because I believe in the elevation of life, intelligence, and freedom. But how you receive my information is your creation and your responsibility. And I do suggest you not undertake the great experiment unless you are clear on this fact. And we're going to stop there for the day. We will pick up next Tuesday with the history of humanity with Sunat Kumar. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon.